Yes, so we're on page 36 of your book. And I wanted to turn to John chapter 2. Chapter 2. Now, Frank's already talked about the overall structure of the Cana to Cana section. I want to have a, just a little bit closer look at one of the things that is happening in Cana. You know, often we think it's just about changing this into... Oh, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> As if, you know, that's the whole point of it. No, 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 no. The whole point of it is, it's a sign. It's a sign. That's what John calls the miracles, signs. That is, it's going to point towards something. And let's look at what it's pointing towards. You know the story well. So I go down to chapter 2, verse 5. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Okay. We're told standing there were six stone water jars. Okay. Now, in in the Old Testament, certain numbers have meaning. So if ever you see the number whoopsie do, there we go, twelve, you you remember it's about the twelve tribes. So it's a way of saying the whole of Israel. And the number seven reminds us of creation, perfection. God only needs seven days to complete the work. So when we come against the number six, it's almost, but not yet, okay? It almost leaning into the seven. You are expecting the seventh. It's as if you're counting one, two, three, four, five, six, and you stop as if the seventh is just about to come. Just remember that. It, it, it does operate here. So we've got these six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding lots and lots. Jesus says, fill the jars with water. They filled them. Take it to the chief steward. They took it. The steward tastes the wine. He didn't know where it had come from. Now look who the steward calls. The steward called the bridegroom. And basically the steward, congratulations. You know, everybody serves the best wine first. Okay, and then, then when everyone's drunk, then you give them the cheap stuff. Now, so what does that tell you about Jewish marriage customs? Whose job is it to supply the wine at a wedding? The bridegroom. Right. Who did supply fantastic wine at this wedding? Therefore, Jesus is the bridegroom. Right. That's what the miracle's about. It's pointing to Jesus' identity. Jesus is now present as the divine bridegroom. And in the Old Testament, that was of a way often of speaking about God's relationship with Israel was likened to a, a marriage, with God as the bridegroom and Israel as, as the wife. Sometimes faithful, often unfaithful. So here's another image, another way John presents Jesus. We've had tabernacle, and now we have Jesus as the bridegroom. Now all of this is going to come together when we look at the role of John the Baptist because you see in a wedding, in a wedding, okay, here's a wedding, a young man. He's a priest. He's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Young woman. Okay. 
<laughs> what are they so from the same parish? <laughs> okay. Now, in our culture, the young man, young woman, they meet one another, they see each other, they get to know one another, and they marry. Right. In that culture, that's not the way it happened. In that culture, this is what would happen. Robin, you go and stand over there. You go and stand over there. <laughs> because of the possibility of shame, what happens if the proposal is made and is refused? The loss of face. Now, if any of you are from an Asian background, you'd know that. That loss of face is, is very bad. So what happens is, instead of these two negotiating it, or even their parents, you have a deputy. So both families call in a deputy. So call a deputy. No, he's your deputy. You call a deputy, it'll be a male. Uh, there we go, get that man too. Okay. <laughs> Good. So what happens is the two, the father, the father of the group. Now you're out of the road. You've got you nothing back, to do with it. <laughs> the father comes to the house, and it's the deputies. Robin, you're out of the road too. The deputies are the ones who make all the arrangements. Right, the fathers go away into the back room and talk about the weather, the footy, the cattle, the crops, anything but marriage. In case the, it, the, the negotiations break down. So that way there can be no loss of face. It's the two deputies who do all the discussion and the most important part of the discussion is the dowry. <laughs> the dowry. What the bridegroom is going to give to the bride you know, on the actual night of the wedding. So these two talk, 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 talk. When it's all signed and agreed, they actually write up the contract. So they hold the marriage contract. Twelve months later, the wedding takes place. Now, when this deputy, Dominic, it's your job to sell him. <laughs> it's your job to present, what's your name? Paul. Paul. To really sell Paul, to tell all the great features of Paul, that he's good looking, he's got, you know, a great herd of cattle, he comes from a great family, he's been well educated, whatever. Because you are his voice. Hey, he, hear that language. You are his voice. You are his voice. You are witnessing to his qualities. And then come the wedding, you actually, you or Paul, might actually go to the house of the bride and bring the bride in. <laughs> Bride comes in. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Who, like most brides, would be veiled? <laughs> okay. No, Paul, you're over there still. <coughs> bride. Uh, keep out of the road, bridegroom. Bride comes in and is taken into. Listen to the language. <laughs> the father's house. Okay, because usually the bride, uh, the bridegroom would just add a room to the family household. So she comes into the father's house, sits in a, the wedding chamber. They're, they're all having their festivities, drinking, 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 even the best wine. And then eventually the bridegroom's friend, that's you, leads the bridegroom into the bridal chamber. Yeah. Hey. Okay. okay, there we go. Now you disappear, oh, okay. but not too far, just stand there. At this point, you get to lift the veil. So sometimes this ceremony was called the lifting of the veil. Uh -huh. So you get to lift the veil. May I? Yeah, yes. <laughs> lift the veil. 
Go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and did you hear what happened? What? He lifted the veil and there's a cry of delight. <laughs> ah, a cry of delight. That's what he's waiting to hear. <laughs> so he's waiting to hear that cry of delight. Okay, he's the witness. He's brought the couple together. The final job in that culture would be he would hang around, produce the wedding sheet the next morning to testify to the virginity of the bride. So there's a lot of witnessing going on here in this role. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So Thank you. Much. When did I get paid? Pardon? When did I get paid? You don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> You're a friend. <laughs> So, that's what John the Baptist is doing. He's introduced as a witness. Uh, he directs disciples, the Lamb of God. Disciples go to Jesus. This, uh, the hint is there that it's towards the end of the day, which is the traditional time of all wedding. It says it's about the tenth hour. So there are lots of little cultural clues going on here about the role of John the Baptist. Then we come to Cana and we have a wedding. We shouldn't be surprised. And at the wedding, the one who is the bridegroom is Jesus. So through the witness of John, through the writing of the narrative, Jesus is introduced to us as the great bridegroom and behind that is the the image of Israel's relationship with God they are a relationship of love of commitment okay and that's part of it now have a look now at what happens next verse 13 now in your Bible you may have a heading you got a heading? Yeah. It probably says, yeah. oh yeah, now this is what you need to do. Take a biro and put a line through that heading. <laughs> the, the, the gospel author did not write this heading, right? So don't feel you're desecrating the Bible. The gospel writer didn't write the cleansing of the temple. An, uh, an editor has done that. Now, this is not Jesus running around hoovering. <laughs> All right, this isn't Jesus hoovering. Look at the clues. We are told the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Okay, Passover. Great celebration of liberation. Everybody wants to come to Jerusalem and celebrate. What happens in the temple at Passover time. What do you know? What are the priests main job at Passover time in the temple? Yeah. Like think of the priest like wearing almost a, a, bar, a, a butcher's apron. His job is to kill animals. That's the priest's job. It, it's a sacrificial role. Okay, so lots of people come to Jerusalem, it's Passover time, uh, you all want to celebrate. And in the Bible you're told very clearly uh, the sort of animal you've got to have. It's got to be a lamb, one year old, male, no blemishes. Now imagine you are living um, I'm trying to think of a place about four days walk away. Byron Bay? Four days walk? Newcastle. Okay. Okay, four days walk. Okay, this is your job. Good. So you're walking from Galilee. Hey, slowly. Four days. You've chosen your lamb, it's one year old, it's male, it's perfect, no blemishes. Walking, 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 it's spring, it's spring. Finally, day four, maybe even day five, you arrive in Jerusalem. How do you feel? 
fit. You feel fit. That's really good. That's not what you're supposed to say. <laughs> Uh, okay, cut. Utterly spent in the uh, Utterly spent, that's correct. Now, have a look at your little lamb. Your little lamb is no longer in peak physical condition. Unless you carried it. Okay, yeah, well, that could help too. But now, this is the time of the year when in Jerusalem, instead of you having to bring or carry your little lamb, you can actually go into the temple and buy it. Now the temple is enormous. Here we go. Now here's the holy part and all around here is like an open area. Even Gentiles are allowed here. Over here there's something called, oops, a sheep gate. Okay, so obviously animals are in and out of the temple all the time. We think it odd because we're used to churches where you don't bring animals. But bringing animals is the prime purpose of having a temple. So you can kill them. So animals are going to be in and out of the temple all the time. So you arrive in Jerusalem and instead of having to bring a lamb, all you need to do is bring some money. The other good thing that happens at this time of the year because it's Passover. For one month before Passover, so just one month, special tables are set up here by the people of Broken Bay Institute. And this is the time of the year when you pay your taxes for the temple. And so here we have somebody who is collecting your taxes. Actually, I need one more person. Can you be a tax collector? <laughs> you're a tax collector. So you see here, you're a tax collector. So this is what we've got. We've got somebody selling lambs. This is John. He's selling lambs. We've got a tax collector. The other problem is, by the time you arrive, if you go to use this money in the temple, it's no good because look whose head is on it. Caesar. Yeah, it looks like Queen Elizabeth, but it's really Caesar, <laughs> right? This is the head of Caesar. So this is idolatrous. So before you do anything, you are gonna to have to change your money. So here's a money changer. There you go. And you get good, pure silver coins without the head of Caesar. So now you've got your money. Now you can go and pay your taxes with pure <laughs> coins and now you can go and buy a sheep. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you people. Make sure I get all my money back please. <laughs> now, everything I've described is an essential part of Israel's worship system. It's the taxes that are paid at this time that pay for the whole upkeep of the temple. You don't have a Thanksgiving giving, you know, offering, like in Catholic churches, where you put money on the plate every year. You pay your taxes once. But that payment pays for the oil, the priest's vestments, the wood, the whole sacrificial system is paid for so that even if you happen to live in Africa or Rome or Greece by paying your temple tax you are considered to be part of the whole worship system and that worship system had at least two lambs killed every day one in the morning one in the evening to bring Israel into relationship with God so just think about that. When Jesus comes into the temple and starts tipping over tables and driving out animals, what's he doing? He's not cleansing the temple. All of these things are meant to be there. They are essential parts of Israel's worship. Quick moment. What does it mean? What does it mean? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Somebody else. 
on. That one was making way for himself. He's changing the system. He's changing mm. the way of worship. Mm. He's basically saying, this system is over. This way of coming to God is over. This system that needs the slaughtering of animals, the paying of temple taxes, that sacrificial system of Israel is now finished. The whole temple system is finished. So it's not a cleansing. It's really uh, a, an announcement that this is finished. But here's the question. If, if this way of coming to God is over, what's it being replaced with? Hmm. And that's where we need to read a little bit more of what's going on. So Jesus comes into the temple. Look at what he says, verse 16. He told them, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house. So Jesus names the temple, the temple that Israel called the house of God, he now calls my father's house a marketplace and his disciples remembered. Now here we meet the characters uh, that you, Frank was talking about before. Verse 18, the Jews. They said to him, now if you'd seen that, what question would you have asked? Why did you do this? You know, what's going on? Why did you do it? But instead, the question they ask is, what sign? Now, signs are your credentials, your authority, your diploma. Okay? In the Old Testament, the prophets, instead of getting a diploma saying, I authorise Isaiah to speak for me, there were signs. The prophet was meant to be able to produce signs. Moses is a great example. So the, the Jewish leaders, they say, what sign can you show us for doing this? Basically, what's your authority? And Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now think of where he's standing. Here. Yep, still right. He's standing there. Of course, they look around at the building and they laugh and they say, you know, it's taken how many years? 46 years. Yeah, Herod had been building or revamping the whole temple area for 46 years and you're going to destroy it, ra raise it up in three days? See, this is, a, this is the brilliance of this author, the uh, wonderful irony that he has Jesus standing inside the building saying destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And of course the, the Jews in the story don't get it. They think he's talking about bricks and mortar. The narrator tells us he spoke of the temple of his body. Now we should know that because Jesus was introduced in the prologue as the tabernacle, remember? Yeah. Okay, the presence of God with us. Well that's what the temple stood for, God dwelling with us. Only now the dwelling place of God is Jesus. So the temple way of coming to God, paying taxes, killing animals, that way's over because now there is a new way. So that's what this scene is about. It's a whole movement away from one way of coming to God to a new way in the person of Jesus. So it's not about a cleansing, okay? You might want to ask questions about that later on because I need to keep moving. Okay, but uh, just keep that in mind. And so important is this scene that John's got in John, we find it here, right at the beginning. In the Synoptic Gospels, it's at the end. But from now on, whenever we see Jesus, we see a temple. The place where God dwells. Jesus. Right at the very beginning, that's who he is. 
bridegroom and temple. Okay, now I want you to turn over to page, uh, might just be on the back of it, 36. Oh yeah, page 36, you might have got it anyway. Nicodemus. Now I've given you the text because in English it's not clear. It's not clear. The Greek um, is, is wonderfully clever. Let's start from what Nicodemus says. Rabbi. So Nicodemus starts, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For it is not possible for anyone to do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Notice it is not possible. Now, Jesus' response is, Jesus answered saying, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born again or born anew, it is not possible to see the kingdom of God. See, it, in the Greek, quite clearly, it's that same word. It's not possible. It is possible. It's not possible. All the way through this dialogue. Now, the English sort of loses that. So now Nicodemus says to him, how is it possible for a person to be born when he is old? It is not possible to enter into the mother's womb a second time and be born. Jesus answered, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, it is not possible to enter into the kingdom of God. A little principle is given. What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, I say to you, you must be born again or born anew. The spirit wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it. You don't know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Replying, Nicodemus says to him, how is it possible? You can almost imagine him throwing up his hands and saying, how is it possible? And look at how Jesus replies here. Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know this? Look at how Nicodemus began the conversation. You are a teacher, come from God, Nicodemus says to Jesus. And the scene finishes with Jesus saying to Nicodemus, Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't get it? This is what Frank was mentioning before about an inclusio. You know, where words are repeated, okay, to sort of mark the beginning and the ending of a passage. Okay, now, right at the centre of this is the question about what is Jesus talking about when he says to be born anew or born again? That's the question, that's what Nicodemus doesn't get. In verse 4, Nicodemus thinks Jesus, he takes Jesus literally. How is it, it's not possible for a person, an old man, to enter into his mother's womb a second time. Literally. Now that Jesus isn't talking literally here. Let's see what he means. Well, at least what I think he means. Always got to be careful. I can sound terribly positive. This is always, this is, this is how I understand it. So verse 6. Jesus answered, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. To be born of water. I understand that this is referring to ordinary human childbirth. When a mother's waters break. That's our first birth. When you and I are born into ordinary human life through our mothers. That's the first birth. And then Jesus goes on to say, and the spirit. That's our second birth. Now it's not yet clear how that's going to happen, 
but we're told it needs to happen. Our first birth, born of our parents, born into human life, born of the spirit means somehow being born into a different sort of life, another quality of life, something other than simply being human life, another quality of life. Let's just leave it at that for the moment. And Jesus says, unless one has that second birth, being born of the Spirit, it's not possible to enter the kingdom of God. And then he explains it further, because you must see Nicodemus is a bit slow. What is born of the flesh is flesh. Right. You and I, born of our parents, are born into ordinary human life. Okay? Flesh, biblically, is anything that will not live forever. So, this is flesh. This is flesh. It's not going to last forever. It will decay. It will wear out. It's atoms. Right? Or your Bible. Or those lollies. Anything at all that is created as distinct from God. If you want to quote, it's Isaiah chapter 40, it's about verse 6, all flesh is grass. No, the, 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 the word, oh, but it's, uh, Frank, would you look that, oh, you haven't got your Old Testament, I'll look it up quickly. Uh, it's Isaiah 40, it's just to quote it, because it's, it's a great little passage. Yeah, I haven't got Isaiah in my Bible. Yes, I do. Students tell me that. Okay. Here it is. Yep. Uh, verse, verse 6. A voice cries, cry out, what shall I cry? All flesh, your text here has people, all flesh is grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are the grass. Or, so flesh, something that will fade compared to the breath, the word, the spirit of God. So we're talking then about two sorts of life. Ordinary human life and the possibility of something more. Later on in John 3, if you'd like to have a look at verse 15 and 16, Jesus calls this different sort of life. So John 3, verse 15 and 16, he calls it eternal life. Or again in verse 16, again, eternal life. So it sounds more like a property, I tend to call it eternity life. The sort of life God lives in eternity. That's what's being offered here. More than simply human life, but something else. Eternity life. Okay. So, that's, that's the dialogue in the Nicodemus. That's what's being offered. So just, just have a look at it again. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, it is not possible to enter into the realm of God. What's born of the flesh is flesh. But what's born of the Spirit is Spirit. Two qualities of life we're being offered. Then at the end of Nicodemus, we return to John the Baptist. And we get that, that beautiful expression that uh, Frank read before. So if you have a look at verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. We saw that in the little mini play. It's the bridegroom's, a friend of the bridegroom's job to lead the bridegroom to the bride. 
and then back away but to rejoice and so John says now my joy has been fulfilled he has brought disciples into an encounter with Jesus now his joy is fulfilled you know the theme of this weekend isn't it is something about joy okay joy is fulfilled what a great theme for evangelization that when we bring people into some sort of encounter with Jesus that can be a source of joy for us our joy can be fulfilled I don't know if it's obvious but I think it is actually Frank and I actually like doing what we're doing <laughs> you know we actually like giving talks all around the place on scripture because this has been a source of life and joy for us and so it is an amazingly joy-filled experience to share that with others I think that's a bit what John the Baptist is saying now my joy has been fulfilled so when, when you're thinking about you know evangelization think of it as a source of joy not simply a burden but joy okay so we've come now from the witness of John we've come to the wedding scene at Cana where Jesus is revealed as a bridegroom we've come into the father's house where Jesus has revealed himself as the the presence of God dwelling in our midst the great image of the temple and then through Nicodemus we're told that there could be a whole new quality of life a whole new birth possible so it, it's still staying sort of within the ambit of marriage life birth etc and then John departs the scene the story of Jesus coming to the Jewish people has now gone through all those stages from perfect faith no faith partial faith to complete faith okay so we'll stop here now